Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Uh, we'll be getting started shortly. We'll be getting started shortly. Thank you those that have joined. We'll be getting started shortly. Amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. We thank God for an opportunity that he's bestowed upon us once again to be able to come before him at his feet to discuss his word. We thank God that we're here, alive, functioning, and we thank God that he continually shows himself strong. He's blessed us with the opportunity to come before him and we thank God again that we're here. We thank God that we're alive. We thank God that we are able to be at his feet once again. We thank God for all that he continues to do. We thank God because he's great. We thank God because he's fantastic. We thank God because there's nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing that he cannot do. There's nothing he cannot do. We thank him. We thank God for giving us this opportunity once again. Um, happy Easter, happy Easter for those that, that celebrated. Um, I know we weren't here last Sunday due to Resurrection Sunday. So I pray that everybody had a blessed Easter. Um, and I pray that everybody's had a blessed last two weeks. I understand with what happened Friday. Um, I'm sure everybody felt the vibrations throughout. Um, those that are watching it that, uh, that are based in either New York or New Jersey. I'm sure that you may have heard or seen something. But we thank God, nonetheless, that he's allowed each and every one of us. He's bestowed life upon us. We are not the ones that are responsible for the things that we see, nor are we, those, are we in any way able to stop or prevent the things that are going on around us. The God that we serve is greater, bigger, larger, stronger than we are. And the world is in his hands, right? The world is in his hands. So... If you are able to be here, if you are able to hear me, if you are able to see me, if you are alive and functioning, let's give all God all the praise and all the glory that He's that He so rightfully deserves. We're going to before we before we even go any further, let's take a moment to dive into prayer, to welcome the Lord, to praise Him, and to thank Him for giving us this opportunity once again. We know that everything that we have is because of Him. There's no way that we can be what we are in any shape or form without him. So let's take a moment to pray and we will dive into the study for today. God, we thank you, we worship you, and we honor you. We give you all the praise and all the honor that you so rightfully deserve. We thank you, Lord God, that we are able to be here and to be at your feet. We know, Lord God, that we are not good, we're not worthy. But we ask you, O God, in this moment in which we are going to go into your word Lord God, let your word shine. Let your word, Lord God, shine light into the darkness. Let your power shine. Let everything of you shine continually. Father, we ask you, please, Lord God, to just let everything that is, that will be said be of you. Father, do not allow us to speak of our own knowledge, of our own wisdom, of our own understanding. But we ask you, O God, that you take control, take first place, take it all for you and for your glory and your glory's sake alone. Father, we are depending on you we trust in you we confide in you and lord there's no one else lord god that we'd rather have as our anchor 
And we ask you, O oh God, please, as we are about to dive into a Bible study, into a study, Lord God, that is based on your word, we ask, O oh God, that you take joy, take pleasure. We ask, Lord God, that you are pleased with everything that is going on. Let your word reach where you want it to reach. Let it reach the ears of those that you want it to reach. And Lord God, let those be blessed. Those ears be blessed. Those hearts be blessed. Those souls be blessed as we have seen before. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. And we ask you, O oh God, please, Father, just take control. Do as you want. Do as you please. We lift everything before you. Have your way. Lord God, reduce us to zero and let your name and your name alone be praised and exalted. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you in your holy son's precious name. We pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Uh, Emmanuel, God is with us. We thank God once again that we are here. Um, again, I miss, I know we it's been two weeks um, and I do apologize for not giving an earlier notice. Two weeks ago, I completely it completely escaped my mind that last Sunday was Easter. Um, so as a result, we did not meet here. I, again, I pray that everybody had a wonderful Easter, uh, whether it be going to church, spending time with family, meeting with family. Um, I hope everybody had a great Easter, but in the midst of all of your activities, I also do pray that you understand the reason for the season, the reason for the day, right? Um, as Jesus said, when he was dying, it was, everything was accomplished. Everything is accomplished, was accomplished through his death. And through his resurrection. And it is because of his resurrection that you and I are able to be here and alive today. So we thank God. We thank God for the ultimate sacrifice. The sacrifice that no longer bounds us to the traditions of the Old Testament. The sacrifice that no longer binds us to having an intermediary, a third party. To having somebody having to communicate with God on our behalf. But now we are free. We're free. Liberated. And able to serve God, understand understandably so, not in the way that he wants, not in, we don't serve him well, please, you know, we can't uh, ignore that. We don't serve him in a manner that pleases him. There's a lot of things that we do wrong, sins that we commit morning, afternoon, and night, but ultimately we thank God. We thank God that he's given us this opportunity and allowed us to come before him. Um, so again, uh, we're going to dive in. For our study for today um and we're going to let god be and god do what he wants what he wants to do how he wants it how he wants to it to be done um so again emmanuel god is with us god is with us and he's allowed us to be here he's god is with us god is with us and he's shown himself strong so we thank god for that um last time i can't say last week last time so two weeks ago we left off speaking once again about the different attributes of God, right? So I pray that it's been making sense as we've gone along. Um, to recap, I want to say I think we started uh, probably three weeks ago looking at the different attributes. Started with the attribute that God is spirit, right? God is spirit. We went from there. We said God is life. God is life. After which we then went into God is perfect. God is perfect. And I believe last time we left off talking about God is unique. God is unique. And we'll continue in that same vein. We'll continue in that same line. God is unique. Um, we'll wrap that up. And then we'll continue in the journey of looking at the different attributes of God and how they relate to us. What do they mean to us? How do How should we interpret them? How should we understand them? What importance does God's attributes have in our lives and how should we move and act accordingly? Okay. So uh, let's open our Bibles. Um, we're going to go into Psalm 136. 136. Um, 136. Ideally, I would love to go through the whole Psalm because the whole Psalm talks about God's uniqueness. But we're not going to be able to go through the whole psalm, but I encourage you to when you get a chance. But let's start Psalm 136. Okay, Psalm 136. We're going to start at the top. Psalm 136. Psalm 136. Psalm 136. Psalm 136. 
again, we're looking at God's uniqueness, right? God's uniqueness. And what does Psalm 136 tell me in relation to God's uniqueness? It says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Okay. Give thanks to the God of gods for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for his mercy endures forever. To him alone does great wonders for his mercy endures forever. God's uniqueness, an aspect of God's uniqueness, only God is good. Okay. Only God is good. Okay. All give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And I want us to understand, you may say, how is it possible to say that God is good? When you look at the common, the average person or the everyday person, I want us to understand that the idea of the word good, right? When we speak on the idea of the word good, for the most part, good is subjective, Right? When we speak of good, more often than not, the word is subjective. What do I mean by subjective? You can have person A, and then you go to person B and C, and you ask them of their opinion of person A. One can say he's good, one can say he's bad. Right? Person A is good in the eyes of person B, person A is bad in the eyes of person C. In other words, good here is subjective. Good is subjective. Good is subjective. When it comes to God, good is not subjective. God is good, period. Okay? God is good, period. And that's the difference between good for the average person versus good for God. God is good, period. Okay? What God creates is good. How do I know that? If you go into Genesis chapter 1 and you look at the story of creation, God did not use any other adjective to describe his creations other than the word good. God looked and he saw it was good. The only thing that God looked at that he saw that was not good was when he created man and he saw that man was alone. And God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. He then said, let me create a helper that resembles them. By which by which he took the man, put the man to a, in a very deep sleep. And probably what we now can consider today to be a sort of a coma, if you will. Put them out and took out the rib of the man and with the rib created woman. And from that day forward, God saw that God, in, God installed the first marriage in the Garden of Eden where he created man and woman. And he said that this is what his definition of marriage looks like, man and woman, right? And he created Adam, created Eve, and he said, this is good, or this is good, okay? Um, everything, God is unique, so what God creates he called it good he looked at the sky called it good looked at the grass called it good looked at the earth the nature everything he looked at and he said it was good god said it was good so again god when we talk about god is unique what an uh, an aspect of god's uniqueness is that god is good god is good okay god is good and god's goodness is in no way subjective god is good to all God is good to all, okay? And everyone, whether we like to believe it or not, accepts that God is good. For example, if you want to believe if that you walking is a good thing, then you must risk believe that God is good because he is the reason that made that is he's the reason that you can walk. Breathing air. If you believe that that's a good thing, then you believe that God is good because God allows you to breathe. Okay? Waking up every day. If you believe that that's a good thing, then again, God is good. Because he's, he's the one that permits that. Everything that happens, God is responsible. So, God is good. God is good. Okay? 
everything that he does is good, okay? Everything that he does, everything that God does is good, okay? When it comes to God, there is not a sense of positivity or negativity. God, as long as God does it, it is good. We may not always see it as good at first glance, but everything you will find to be good one day. For example, you may, God put somebody in your life today, you don't like them, can't stand them. Three months down the line, that's the only person that's standing with you through your dark times. And then that's when you realize, you know what, God? That's, God is good, right? A lot of times, there's a lot of lessons that we learn. We don't learn them that day. We don't have to lie to ourselves. There's certain lessons that certain things that we have to go through. We don't accept them right then and there, but we're forced to. We're forced to down the line. We're forced to. We're forced to. Okay. So God is good. Let's turn to Daniel. Daniel chapter four. Let's turn to Daniel. Daniel chapter four. And look again at another aspect of God's goodness. Daniel. Daniel chapter four. Daniel chapter four. Daniel chapter four. Daniel chapter four. Daniel chapter 4. Please, please do yourselves a favor again. Please have your Bibles. Please have your Bibles. Okay? Please have your, your Bibles while we're going through. Get used to your Bible. Flip the pages. Don't just wait for the verses to come on the screen. This is just for us to follow together. But I encourage you, have a Bible. Underline the verse. Write the verse down. And then post you can go through them look at them understand them so that you can use them for yourself okay daniel chapter 4 verse 34 it says at the end of the time i nebuchadnezzar lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me and i blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? Okay. And let's read verse 36 too. At the same time, my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Okay. Daniel chapter 4, 34 to, 30, 34 to 36. Right. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, who is that? Who is who's Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar was a king, okay? He was a king. Um, he was a king that ruled, and he ruled for a little bit, for a little bit of time. But he was struck, unfortunately, with a very bad prophecy of sorts. And if you want to know what that prophecy is, we can look back and see if I go back to verse 31. It says, uh, I think verse 31, just to save time, we'll start at verse 31. It says, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. The voice said what? It said, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Right? So King Nebuchadnezzar, well, actually, let's read verse 33 to show you what happened. King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 33, says that very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body Look at what happened to his body. He says his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like birds' claws. Nebuchadnezzar became an animal. 
right? It says that his body was wet with the dew of heaven. His hair had grown like eagles as feathers. If you've ever seen an eagle, hopefully if you haven't, then take a moment, Google, look at a picture of an eagle and his eagle's feathers so you can see what Nebuchadnezzar's hair turned into. And his nails turned into the claws of a bird. So Nebuchadnezzar essentially went from a man to an animal. Okay? And this is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And this same Nebuchadnezzar, later on, after understanding that God is the true ruler, he then sang this song where he said, that God, he praised God, blessed God, and understood that even though he may be king, the true king is God. Nebuchadnezzar recognized that he's a king, but God is the king of kings. So in this, I want us to understand as part of God's uniqueness, God is sovereign. He's sovereign. S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N. God is sovereign. He is a ruler. God is the ruler. God is the king of kings. God is the Lord of lords, the Lord of hosts. God is the ruler, okay? God is the ruler. God is God is that God is that guy. God God is him. Right? God is God. Okay? There's no other way to to, to explain that. God is God. God is God. God is supreme. God is the king of kings he is ruler and he made nebuchadnezzar accept that very very quickly god is king okay god is king there is no one that can do what god does and as much as the world establishes its 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 um its authority through its own means even if you look for example in romans chapter 13 that tells you that all power and authority was established by god alone God, as much as he established authority on this earth, understand that God is the king of kings. As part of God's uniqueness, he establishes the authority on this earth. He may not condone everything authority does. I want that to be very clear. But he established authority of this earth. He made rulers on this earth, but he is still the ruler of the rulers. God is king of kings. Okay. So again, God is unique. God is sovereign. Last uh, two more points of God's uniqueness that I want us to look at. First Samuel, first Samuel. Let's turn to first Samuel, first Samuel, first Samuel. Again, please flip through your Bibles, go through the verses, look for the verses, go through the verses, okay? Read them. It makes your life easier. It makes my life easier. God Let's look at another aspect of God's uniqueness. Some of these we'll, just, we'll, we'll explore in more detail, but I'm just passing over them for now because I just want us to understand God is unique. When you say someone's unique, it means that they have characteristics in them that nobody else has, okay? So we're just looking at several of those characteristics that make God unique, okay? 1 Samuel 2 verse 2, No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. So I guess this verse is a, is a dead giveaway. God is holy. Okay. Part of God's uniqueness, what makes him unique is God is holy. And secondly, God is a rock. God is a rock. What do you mean? What do I mean by rock? For example, you may hear, for example, if a husband is maybe talking about their wife or vice versa, they can say that that person is my rock, my solid foundation. Right? They are my rock. They are my rock. They are my solid foundation. They are my day one. They are my they're 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 the ones that 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 I can base on, that I can stand on, that I can count on, that I can trust in. They are my rock. God is that rock. God is that rock. He is the original rock. Okay? He is the original rock. God will not do you wrong like mankind can and will. God is the rock. So God, again, is we see here two things. What? God is holy and God is our rock. Okay? And the last thing I want us to understand, God is faithful. 
God is faithful. Okay. God is faithful. There is none like him. God is faithful. He holds his promises. Everything that God says he will do, he does. Okay. Everything that God says he'll do, he will do, he does. Okay. So that's God's uniqueness. God is unique. Let's go on to the next. And yes, I'm pushing through this a little bit just because I want to try to get to at least two today. Um, cause if we don't, we will be on God's attributes until, until, until the end of the year. So I want to try and do this a bit quicker. Um, so we'll go through them a little bit quicker, but okay. So God is unique. Next God is eternal. 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 Let's take a look at God's eternalness, if you will. God's eternalness. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Okay? Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Psalm 90, verse 2. Psalm 90, verse 2. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. When I say God is eternal, it means that God has no beginning, he has no end. God has no beginning, he has no end. Okay? God is forever. God is omnipotent, omnipresent. God is everlasting everlasting there is no expiration date on god okay he's everlasting and if he wasn't everlasting we'd all be screwed because god's everlastingness assures us that there is no such thing as god will die jesus as human died but he resurrected that's the reason why we celebrated easter he died as a human but resurrected he resurrected. Jesus is very much so alive today. Okay? He's very, very much so alive. Let's keep looking more about God's e eternalness. First Timothy. First Timothy. First Timothy. Okay? First Timothy. First Timothy. Uh, I almost lost it. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter six, first Timothy chapter six, first Timothy chapter six, first Timothy chapter six, we shall start at verse 13. First Timothy chapter six, let's start at verse 13. Okay. It says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. And before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, right? immortality who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see to whom be honor and everlasting power amen this is to the god that you serve he is immortal god is immortal okay and when i say immortal true True immortal, not the type of immortality that they show you on TV shows where the guy eventually dies anyway. No. Immortal. Immortal. God is immortal. Okay? And he dwells in a light that is unapproachable. 
a light that shines too bright, a light that is worse than the rays of the sun, okay? At least with the sun, you can take a nice little camera, you take a picture of it, more than likely you'll be okay. If you can't take a picture of God's light, your camera will break, okay? God is immortal, dwelling in unapproachable light. God is someone no man has or can see, okay? And God has everlasting power. God's power does not expire. Why is that good? It's good because it means that anything God says that he will do, he can do, even if it takes time. Anything that God tells you he will do, he will do. You can trust that, take it to the bank, that you can trust and believe. Anything that God tells you he will do, he will do. Even if it's something that your eyes may not see, it will happen. If God promises you he will do something for you, he will do it. The problem nowadays is because most of the time we don't hear God's voice. We hear the voice of people who either impersonate or we, we, go, we go according to our own emotions, which drive us, unfortunately, on a bad, a bad street, on a bad, um, on a bad path. But the truth, truth be told, if God speaks anything that he says, you can trust it. You can very much so trust it. God is, God is God. Okay. God is very much so God. You can trust him. God is immortal. He has everlasting power. His power does not drain. His power has no source. It's not as if God will run out of power one day. No, God is limitless. Okay. He's limitless. There's nothing he cannot do. God is limitless. He's powerful. He's all knowing. God is everlasting. Okay. Everlasting. Exodus. Exodus. Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, um, we're not going to, I'll pass over this very, very quickly, I do think it's a verse that we've seen already, so I'll pass over it quickly, okay, God said to Moses, I am who I am, I am who I am, that's a very powerful statement to make. But God is eternal. In other words, words cannot define God. God is not limited to words. He's not limited to time. He's not limited to a definition. Understand, even going through this, we're talking about God's attributes, but we're not defining God in any way. The attributes that we go through do not fully encompass God. They do not fully captivate God in all of his glory. They are just different attributes that are good for us to know, but by no means fully tell us everything we ought to know about God. God is eternal. And hence, when Moses asked, God, when, pe when I go and they ask me, who sent me? What should I say? I am who I am. Okay? I am who I am. Let's look again, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, for us to understand that God is eternal. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. And verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In the beginning, it says, in the beginning, God was there. In the beginning, God was there. It doesn't tell you that God was created in the beginning. It says that in the beginning, God was there. So in other words, the beginning does not define God's birth, if you will. The, the beginning doesn't say that God was born here. There is no birth certificate for God. Okay? There is no birth certificate. You cannot find what hospital he was born in. You can't find what date he was born in. You can't find anything. And even the Bible itself says, when it tells you in the beginning, 
In the beginning was God. It does not mean that God was born here. It just says that in the beginning, God was there. So in other words, what we know began with God. That's all we know. But the beginning itself, and I know it's a, it sounds really weird to swallow, but the beginning was not the beginning of God. The beginning is the beginning of time. It's the beginning of what we know and what we can understand, but it is in no way the beginning of God. God is there even before the beginning and he will be there even after the end. Why? Because God is eternal. God is eternal. God is eternal. God is eternal. Okay? God is eternal. So God is eternal. I want us to I want us to understand this one is very important. God is eter God is eternal. Okay? Um let's look at another verse to to to, to continue understanding God as being eternal. Isaiah Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Okay, Isaiah chapter 40. It says sorry verse 13 it says what it says who has directed the spirit of the lord or as his counselor has taught him who teaches god who has directed god's spirit who's the one directing god's spirit and who is the one that's teaching him with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice. Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? All of us here, we were once babies, then had, you know, had parents that taught us and, you know, raised us. We had school teachers, right? All of that stuff. We have counselors, we have mentors, we have older siblings. Sometimes even younger siblings that can teach us. We have all types of people that teach us. But who taught God? Who sat and taught God? Who instructed God? Who showed God? Who instructed God? Who did that? Who did that? God is eternal. God could not be taught if no one was there at the time in which he was created. God could not have been, if God wasn't taught, if God created everything, God wasn't taught how to create everything. But he didn't need that because God was there way before everything. God knows everything. Everything, the world's, what the world knows and understands is what God allows us to know and understand. It's what God allows us to accept. God is the one that makes everything clear. For example, God is the one that's the creator of the human body. What science knows about the body, God permits. But when God wants to shake up the world and send things to show that he is different, there's things like COVID. There are things like COVID that will make us turn all upside down and go crazy trying to find a, a cure or something. Right, trying to find some way to, to to undo what what's what we see, and nothing happens in the Bible. You will see the there there is leprosy, uh, a sickness that up to now. And cure, it's not curable. Cancer, I mean, yes, people are gonna make you go through chemo, but essentially chemo. Pretty much kills you. For the most part, I mean, it's not a it's not a guarantee. It's not a surefire thing. It's something that they people try early, but not everybody can say that they. And I'm sure everybody knows. Not everyone that's taken care of chemo has lived to tell the tale. Some have, some haven't, and there are some that have cancer that never even entered chemo, and were healed. 
because science is limited to what God allows it to know. God teaches us, but no one teaches him. God is immortal. He's eternal. Okay? Eternal. And God takes counsel, instruction from no one. No one taught God. Because if someone taught God, then someone had to have been there before him. But no one was. God's eternal. Okay? Last verse I want us to look at in, under, in looking at God's eternalness, eternal nature. Psalm, let's go back again. Let's go back again. Um, I want to I want to revisit a verse that we just looked at because I don't I didn't get through everything the way I should have. Let's turn back to Psalm ninety. I want us to go back to Psalm ninety. I did not go through all of this, so I want to do this before we move on. Psalm ninety. I think we read it, but we only read verse two. I want us to actually read more than just verse 2 because I think there's more to it than what we see um, let's read let's just also include verse 4 Psalm 90 I also want to include verse 4 it says for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night God is not limited by time God is not limited by time. God is not limited by time. Okay? God is not limited by time. God is not limited by time. Okay? God is not limited by time. So, a thousand years in God's sight, it was like yesterday. Yesterday for us is 24 hours. Yesterday for God can be a thousand years. God is not list God is not limited by time. And that's the usually the biggest and what I want us to take away from this for us to understand, this is usually the biggest reason why people are in are struggle to serve God. You know what the unfortunate part of being unlimited or being not limited by time? God works on his own clock. God doesn't have a 24-hour clock that he has to adhere to. God doesn't have a 24-hour clock that he has to abide by. The fact that God is not limited by time, he does things when he wants to. And unfortunately, yesterday for us, like I said, is 24 hours and yesterday for God could be a thousand years. So the biggest problem that a lot of us, that a lot of Christians face when serving God is this word called patience. We're very impatient. And we are impatient. And the why and why are we impatient? We're impatient because again, God does not act on your time. I'm sorry. God does not act on your time. You have, you can't blackmail God. Okay. You can't blackmail him. What do I mean by that? You can't sit here and force God to do something that he doesn't want to do. You can't hang something over God's head to make him do something. God is not limited by time. And because God is not limited by time, it's like we love to say when, you know how we love to say, oh, I don't have to do this right now. I have time. We say that all the time, right? I got time. Now imagine God. Well, if he says the same thing, I have time. The problem is though, when God says he has time, you just don't really know when his time will come. When will his time come? And that's the biggest problem that screws over a lot of Christians. We tend to believe that God has to act on our timing. That's completely false. In no way does God have to act on your time. God acts on his time. And his time 
he knows why. He knows why. He knows exactly why. You know, for example, for those of you who watched my testimony, my mother went seven years without having kids. Right? Why did my mom, why did God decide to make my mother wait seven years? Why is it that God made it so that I was born at the time that I was? Well, I, like I said, I like to believe that God chooses everyone's partner and spouse in the future. I like to believe that a lot of us people may not. I do. I like to believe that God chooses. If God decided that he was going to create or put me at a time let's say five years earlier, it's hard to believe that my wife and I would have gotten together or gotten married because we would have been in two completely different periods of our lives, two completely different time periods. We're already four years apart, so had I would have been five years earlier, that's nine. Some people are okay with nine years. Some people may be okay with 10. Life dictates a lot. God does things at his own time, but he knows why. You may not know why God does the thing that he does at the time that he does. And quite frankly, God is not obliged to explain himself to you. God has no reason to. God is God by, I mean, let's think about it. If you right now are working in a company and the CEO decides to make a decision, does the CEO have to come down to every single employee and tell them, oh, I'm making this decision because of X, Y, Z. No, he does not. No, they don't. They have no reason. They are not obliged to explain what they do. They have their little committee. They pass their rules and their laws. And all the employees have to deal with it. You don't want to deal with it, then you quit. Simple. God has no reason to explain himself to you. He does what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. And I, that's part of the fun of being eternal. Time does not limit time. God has no stopwatch. There's, there's, there's nothing that tells God, you know, oh, I have to act now. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. What? How can it be too late for the person that is the author of time? How can it ever be too late for the one that, that, that controls everything? <laughs> How can it ever be too late? It can be too late in our eyes. But that's why God says what he says in Romans 8, verse 28. All things are for the good of those who love him. We don't, we may not like it, that's fine, but God is not out to please you. I want that to be very clear. You want to serve God, he will take care of you. He will help you. He will aid you. He will give you what he feels you need. But he's not there to cater you to you, to baby you, to make you, you know, to consistently always putting his hand over your your eyes, over your face, blah, 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 to, to try and make you, no. You're going to cry at times. You're going to be hurt at times. You're going to wish things were different at times. And let me tell you something, things that you go through, it hurts God to watch you go through certain things. But the pain that God feels from watching you go through certain things is not enough to make him take you out of it. Because he knows that there's a bigger thing waiting for you at the end. Okay? God is eternal. Bounded by nothing. Okay? Nothing. So, God is eternal. That's why uh, we did. God is unique. We finished that. We said God is eternal. Time is already killing us, so we're not going to be able to go through everything, but I will start it. The next one I want to look at is God is holy. God is holy. God is holy. God is holy. And I can say honestly, it's understanding God's holiness, I think, in my opinion. If you understand God's holiness... Not completely, obviously, because no one can completely understand God's holiness. So I'm not saying that we have to completely understand it. But if you understand God's holiness enough, there are certain things, even if the Bible tells you 
doesn't tell you black on white not to do it, you will know not to do it. If you understand God's holiness, there are certain things, even if the Bible doesn't tell you black on white to do, you'll still do it. Unfortunately, a lot of times when somebody tells you that God doesn't like you doing X, Y, Z, the first thing you do, oh, I don't see that black and white in the Bible. Here's an, ex here's an example. There's nowhere in the Bible that says black and white, God says don't smoke. You're not going to find that. But the first thing that you'll hear a lot of people tell you, which I... I can't really say I completely condone because I feel like people use that verse when it's convenient, but not all the time. But nonetheless, most people, the first thing that you'll hear people tell you is Romans chapter 12. God says you have to present your body as a living sacrifice. God, your body is a temple of God. So because your body is a temple of God, you can't do things to destroy it. One of the things that you're doing to destroy it is smoking. That's, 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 that's usually what you're going to hear from people. I'm not saying this to tell you that you know, what, that smoking is good. No, I'm not here to say that. Please understand that. I'm not saying that at all. Nor am I saying that God condones it because he doesn't. But there are certain things, if you understand that God is holy, you'll understand why certain things are bad to do. There are certain things, for example, when, the God, when God told the people of Israel, do not, do not, enter into what is known as fornication sex before marriage he didn't do it he didn't tell them to do that because he didn't enjoy he didn't want them to enjoy it i mean for crying out loud god put marriage together and god is the one that made it god is the one that defined how reproduction works so i mean for crying out loud it's not like god doesn't like it's not like god hates it however in the old days one of the things that the non-believers did to worship their pagan gods, their false gods, their fake gods, was fornication. And God refused to have his people look like those who are non-believers. So, as a result, God said, that's what they do, you won't do it. So what am I trying to say here? Understanding God's holiness enough will make you understand that there are certain things. If it is done by non-believers, it cannot be done by me. If I consider myself a believer of Christ. And that's why I say, if you truly understand that this aspect, and we'll go into, I'm just going to show us one verse very quickly. Before we wrap up, if you truly understand God's holiness, there are certain things you will not need someone to tell you not to do. You will just know not to do it. There are certain things, if you understand that God's holiness means that he wants people to be separated apart from the rest, then you will know that if this is something that the world does, that people that are not believers do that people that do not believe in god do i cannot consider myself christian if i find myself doing those same things okay isaiah let's turn into isaiah isaiah this will be our last verse for the day as it's already time isaiah isaiah chapter 6 Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim each one had two wings seraphim is just an angel we'll 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 there will be a time we'll start to, to to talk about angels but here you can see it gives you a very vague idea of what an angel looks like it says an angel each one has six wings two wings 
covered the face, two wings covered the feet, and two wings are used to fly. In the presence of God, even the angels had to cover their face and their feet in front of God. Okay? So two wings for the face, two wings for the feet, two to fly. Okay? This is what the seraphims look like. And then the seraphims cried out to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Very famous verse that I'm sure a lot of people already know. This vision that happened after the time of King Uzziah died. And I mean, I'll maybe next week when we start, I'll go very briefly over King Uzziah, his significance here, why his death led to Isaiah having this vision. Um, what he did that was so wrong that got that made this even possible. But what I want us to look at here is God is not just holy. God is not just holy. God is three times holy. That's how the angels refer to God. Three times holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Okay? God is not just holy. I want us to understand that. The Bible says that the angels say that God is three times holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Okay? So next week, that's where we'll pick up, talking about God's holiness. Um, again, I don't see any questions in the comments, so I pray that everything was straightforward, everything was clear. Uh, we will resume next week again, same time, Sunday, 3.30, in which we will continue to talk about God's holiness. If for any reason whatsoever, anybody, if you're watching me, you have any questions, comments, or concerns, anything at all that you were not able to, that you did not get a chance to ask on this Bible study during the live, then I encourage you to reach out to me via email. God is with us 128 at gmail.com. God is with us 128 at gmail.com. The email again you'll find in the banner below. You'll also find it in the description below. Um, so I encourage you, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email and I will get back to you ASAP and or mention the question on Bible study during the live so that it can be beneficial for, or, or if I feel like the question is beneficial to others, then we'll discuss it on the live so that everybody else can also hear it. Um, other than that, I encourage you, if you have not already, um, in the description, you can also find a link to my testimonial, um, understanding more about me. You will learn about me, my testimony, how I got here, how we got here. If you are interested, if you have not, um, if you want to know a little bit more about me, then I encourage you to watch the video. It's in the link. Yes, it's a bit long, but it is a testimony, a testimony that has blessed, that has blessed souls that has reached places further than I could have even imagined. My birth, my existence is not a coincidence, nor is it something that could have been done by the power of man, but it is God and God alone that allows me to be here. And I can say it is because God is indeed eternal. He is all powerful. And that is, and that, and, and that is the reason and the reason alone that I am alive and that my twin sisters are alive, that we are alive, that we exist, um, that is by God's grace. So I encourage you, if you have them, if you have some time, give it a watch, give it a listen. Um, and I pray that it blesses you. And I also encourage you, please. This is a Bible study. I'm not asking for anything of any, of anyone. God, by his grace has blessed me and has taken care of me. The only thing I do ask of anyone here is to share this, the page with others, share the Bible study with others. Why? Because again, we will, we, we will quickly share an Instagram post. We'll quickly share a TikTok that has absolutely no relevance, no importance to a human life. We'll share a WhatsApp link. We'll share a picture. We'll share anything that means nothing. Let's take a time instead to share the word of God. That's what God asked of us in Acts 1 verse 8, where he told us that we 
upon that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon us so that we will have the power to spread the gospel to all corners of the earth. And sp sharing the gospel to all corners of the earth can be done as simply by just sharing. Share it with someone that you know that needs to hear the word, that needs to hear the gospel. We're very much so in our infancy, just starting, just diving in into the mysteries, into the wonders of who God is. And it's a perfect time for others to join, for people to listen especially young people out there that you know is lost, that you know is going through something that has nothing, that doesn't, that isn't sure about what to do. Now is the time. Send them. So let's come this way. The Bible says that, and I'll be more than happy. I'll even put the verse up next week. The Bible says that you helping a soul, saving a soul covers a multitude of sins. The sins that you may commit, God is willing to forgive them simply because of the fact that you brought a soul to Christ. Multitude of sins. That's what the word says, not me. And I'll be more, it's just because I forget the, the verse off the top of my head, the numbers, the chapter. But if it, but I will be more than happy to find it and I could share with you next week. That's what God's power, that's what the bringing someone to Christ does. So I encourage you, let's do that together. Continue to share the word in the gospel so that others can be blessed and saved the same way we're able to be blessed and saved today. Amen. On that note, let's do our final prayer and then we'll let everybody go. Father, what can we say but thank you? How? What can we say but thank you, O oh God, for giving us once again an opportunity to come before you? Lord God, we are nothing. We are without force. We are without power, without strength. In the same way Nebuchadnezzar realized himself as, as we saw, Lord God, he was a king, yes. But even as a king, he, didn't, he realized that true dominion did not belong to him, but it belonged to you. So Lord God, yes, you may be able to use me as a vessel, but I'm not the author of your word. I'm not the author of what you've given me. I'm not the author or the source of anything that's coming out of my mouth. Lord God, all of that, all of that credit, all of that glory belongs to you and to you alone. And Lord God, may you may you continue to receive all the glory from my lips and may my lips continue to exalt and bless your name. God, we thank you once again for another Sunday afternoon that you've given us to come at your feet and to discuss your word. And we ask you, oh God, please, that let every soul and heart that listened, let them be blessed, Lord God, with the word and let them, Lord God, allow, allow the word to not just come and just stay uh, and be tossed away at the wayside or for uh, an evil bird to come and take it off, but let our hearts be good soil so that the word can find a place to stay, to grow, to reproduce, Lord God, so that your name can be praised and glorified. I ask you, Lord God, that you, anything that was said that should not have been said, that you remove from our hearts and our minds, anything that should have been said that was not, you will add. Again, God, I thank you. I thank you for each person that took time out of their Sunday to listen. Bless them, Lord God. Bless them, O God. And your name shall continually forever be praised. Again, God, we thank you. Here, as we're about to depart, Lord God, continue to be with us throughout the rest of the Sunday, throughout the rest of the week, and let your name continually be praised. We thank you, we honor you, we glorify you. In your holy son's precious name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. May the God that created heaven and the earth, may the God that is the sovereign God, the holy God, the eternal God that created all, that sees all, that knows all, the God that says that he never sleeps, the God that says he watches our going outs and our coming ins. May this God, the God that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the God that allowed me to be here today, the God that I proudly and happily call my God, may he continue to be with you. May he continue to protect you. May he continue to guide you. May he continue to comfort you. And may he continue to bless you in everything that you do. May God be with you. May God protect you. May God stay with you. Amen, amen, and amen. Have a blessed week, and I pray that I see everyone again next Sunday. God bless you all.